Ryan ready back there? Okay, we're gonna we're gonna get a countdown here and I'll introduce you and you can come on up. Okay. Good morning everyone. We want to welcome you to our Sunday school. Everybody will be down here for classes and everything this morning. Uh, we're going to be starting our spring revival uh, seminar, whatever you want to call that. We have uh, a team of men here from the uh, Creation Truth Foundation with their mobile museum. And you can see up here on the stage many of the beautiful fossils and everything that they have here for us to be able to look at. And um, Ryan Cox is our speaker. He's going to be presenting our revival in that for us. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to him. That way he has enough time to talk about uh, the mission, uh, their work, uh, but then also teach us some things. And he said, if you're nice, he'll give you 20 seconds to ask one question at the end. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> but uh, good to see everybody. Let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer, and then Ryan will come up. Let's pray. Dear God and Heavenly Father, we love you and praise you. We thank you for life and the blessings of life that you grant to us. And we again thank you that Ryan and uh, Bob were able to get here successfully. Uh, yesterday, the men worked very hard and diligently putting everything together on the stage. We thank you for their energies and strengths. And now be with us, dear God. Help us to be able to learn this information about the creation, about what a, a wonderful creator and designer you are. Help um, Ryan as he delivers these messages. Help him to recall that he studied and read and um, prepared and planned to present to us. And help us to have open hearts and minds and to be able to learn and to grow and gain in our wisdom and knowledge and understanding of your word. Help many to come. Help us to have a great fellowship later today at our meal and then also this evening. And we ask and pray that all the things that we say and do this day may bring honor and glory and praise to you. And we love you and we thank you for Christ, the great King of kings and Lord of lords. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. All right, Ryan, come on up. And Bob uh, Duga is out there at the table, and uh, he'll be selling books or information and that for you. Didn't want to forget about him. He's also the driver of the truck and the, the museum and everything. All right. <laughs> well, thank you. Good morning. It is quite a blessing to be here. As uh, This is something we've been looking forward to for about two years. Uh, that's when Covey first asked me about uh, coming and uh, bringing the dinosaur fossils and all that stuff. So uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for this opportunity. We are Creation Truth Foundation. That is the name of our ministry. And it was started uh, over 30 years ago now by Dr. G. Thomas Sharp up here in uh, the corner up here. Dr. Sharp, just to let you know, this is what has fueled our ministry and why this ministry exists. Dr. Sharp was a science teacher for many years, and what he was noticing was the rapid exit of young people from the church, and that they were leaving the church and they were losing their faith. And what he, he embarked on a very long, in-depth study regarding what is causing this, what is leading to this, uh, like, kind of like before Barna Group was doing some of this. And he found a lot of statistics about what was happening, the breakdown of the family unit, and the falling away from the faith due to a crisis of faith that happens in higher levels of education in the secular realm. See, here's what happens. He said, he said, we have these young people who go to church all their lives and everything. They grow up in the church and everything, but then we're losing anywhere from 75 to 90 percent, uh, especially de depending on which, uh, on if you're looking at a denomination or not. Um, they're losing their young people and they're going away. And many of them don't ever return. And what he found was the seeds of doubt began being sown into their minds at very young ages because at church they learned nice, wonderful Bible stories that had these moral lessons to them. But then when they went to school, they learned actual science and real history. And what was being taught in the realms of academia did not match what was being taught in the nice little story time at church. And thus, one was just a 
moral application, whereas the other one was reality. And so these seeds were sown, and definitely by the time you got to university level, um, we're losing three out of four young people from the church. That's a good track record. Hmm. So he felt the, the, the urge, the calling to go into this ministry of dealing with origins, of dealing with the foundations of Scripture and how the Word of God is actual real history. It is actual real, whenever it makes some kind of claim, scientifically accurate. Everything about the Scriptures, there's not a word of it that isn't right because... It is an incredible book. So that's my background when I come into this is I'm a history guy, okay? I'm not a scientist. Let me make that as clear as I can. I am not a scientist, okay? Uh, I am a researcher. That's what I was trained to do. Went to the uh, University of Edwardsville, uh, Illinois, and, uh, and got my degree in history and teacher certification, education, all that kind of stuff. And I just love, love to study. I love, love history. And guess what my favorite history book is? Okay, this is my favorite history book because here's the amazing thing about it. Has there ever been any type of historical reference in this book has ever been found to not be true? And you see, I studied in the secular realm under secular guys, all this, and not a single thing ever in archaeology, in geography, in historical documentation, nothing. Not one detail has ever shown that there was a name wrong, a place wrong, a location wrong, a time wrong. Not one. That's a pretty good track record. You realize how often we have to revise history books, though? Because we'll discover something that was written, and oh, that's not exactly... You know the historical, just from, just from pure uh, academic standards, the historical reliability of this, as in how it was transferred to us, transmitted to us, how the record has been handed down through history to us is unmatched in all the world. There is nothing that even comes close to this. I can prove the existence of Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection better than I can prove to you Julius Caesar ever existed. When you look at the actual historical documentation and support for it, and yet you don't ever see anybody in university like, well, you know, my faith in Julius Caesar is just a little lacking. <laughs> you never see anybody question the existence of Julius Caesar or that he was this great uh, you know, military leader and emperor and all that kind of stuff. You never see that. Yet why is Jesus questioned? And why is his word questioned? See, these seeds are being laid out and... Dr. Sharp was so compelled by this that he actually created a whole full-time ministry to be able to address these issues, especially all the way down to the foundation, beginning with the very first verse of all the Scripture, that in the beginning, God created. Not a random happenstance explosion of matter that somehow self-organized itself into operating systems, and eventually life. No, in the beginning, God created everything. And this morning during our serv main service, we're going to look at how crucial and how foundational this is to the actual gospel of Jesus Christ. So he began touring and going around and having these lectures and everything. And then there was one time there was an occasion where there was a Christian paleontologist. You didn't even know they existed, did you? Paleontologists are the science guys who deal with fossils. They dig up fossils. And there was this guy, Joe Taylor, down in, in Texas, and they brought in a bunch of uh, dinosaur fossils and everything. And they packed the place. And this little light bulb goes off in Dr. Sharp's head. He's like, hey, people may not always want to come to hear me, but guess what they'll want to come see? Dinosaurs. Who doesn't want to see dinosaurs? the little girl that ran off crying when she saw the teeth. But, you know, besides her, okay, everyone else is like, yeah, this, that's exciting. And so he saw these as an incredible opportunity to open the door for people to come in, and he gets to talk about dinosaurs. And believe me, we're going to talk about dinosaurs. Don't miss tonight. Oh, we're, it, it's all dinosaurs tonight. Dinosaur fun night tonight. Okay, lots of dinosaurs. And so he, and they come in, and then guess what he gets to share with them? 
how they relate to God's word and the saving news of Jesus Christ. And so he always called these God's gospel lizards. That's what he, that's what he, he called them, okay? So he began that ministry many years ago. 20 years ago this year, he doesn't look it. Mr. Bob Dugas joined the ministry to really pretty much run the ministry. He is the backbone, the, the Dugas family here. Uh, it is pronounced Dugas. It's Louisianian. I don't know. That it's a different language. Anyway, um, that's where Bob's originally from, but he's lived most of his life in Oklahoma, and his wife Michelle and their family there. Um, he came and pretty much, uh, I mean, he literally runs the whole thing. I mean, without him, there is no CTF. He does all the behind-the-scenes stuff and just operates it uh, just to a phenomenal degree. And uh, he, he not only is the one who drives the truck, he's the one who knows how all these go together and all the logistics and everything, it's all done through Bob. I just come and just run overflow of the mouth. You know, that's all I could do. <laughs> yeah, so so uh, Bob and his family joined full-time 20 years ago this year and uh, has been an incredible blessing to us. And uh, then Matt Miles, Dr. Sharp in uh, 20... 18, uh, f- decided it was kind of time to step back, start to kind of go into retirement. He still preaches and teaches from time to time. And uh, Matt Miles um, was a gentleman who joined the ministry in 2006. He had been a youth minister uh, in Kansas, uh, grew up in Colorado as well, went to Manhattan Christian College. And uh, he was really excited about the ministry and, and went, had helped, helped him set up some different, a lot of different events throughout Kansas and everything. And Dr. Sharp said, I need a, I need a guy who will, um, who will come join the ministry. And Matt's like, I'm just a youth minister guy. What do I know about dinosaurs? He said, no, 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 I can teach you the science, but I need somebody who will help reach young people. And Matt kept turning him away all the time and everything. Matt's story is he was at a, um, a Bible symposium at Ozark Christian College, and Dr. Sharp was speaking there. And Dr. Sharp does his presentation about dinosaurs and the Bible and everything, and Matt's like, wow, that is great stuff. And then he thought about it, and then he got really mad. He's like, why have I never heard about dinosaurs in church? I am a Bible college graduate, and I've never heard about how dinosaurs fit with the Bible. Oh, he was upset. (laughs) He's like, why have we never answered these questions? And then it really got into, no wonder young people leave the church because we never provide any answers regarding this stuff. Now, I'm not saying about this congregation. I'm just talking about in general, throughout the world, throughout the nation, th- this is what we're seeing happening. And so eventually he felt very compelled to accept Dr. Sharp's offer and join the ministry in 2006. What's really funny about that is in uh, June of 2006, my dad, preacher at uh, the Toledo Christian Church in Illinois, had this guy named Dr. Sharp and all these dinosaur fossils come to the church. And I got to sit like right about there. And I was like, wow, that's good stuff. Man, that is amazing. Wow, what an incredible, fun thing. I met Bob, you know, and everybody's like, wow, man, what a cool ministry. You get to travel around with dinosaur fossils. But man, I would never do that. Have to move to Oklahoma where they have tornadoes and rattlesnakes, my two favorite things. No way, ever. Never. Well... <laughs> Then, just a couple weeks later, I met, uh, didn't know at the time, my future wife. And so that was a pretty, pretty neat year for me. Well, then, um, in 2018, I had um, I'd gone into full-time ministry after uh, being in education for seven years. And I was preaching at the local church. And my wife and I kind of just felt the call to be able to go wherever the Lord led us in uh, missions. We were very big on, in mission support. And I had been working with Matt for many years. We had developed a week of church camp at Oil Belt Christian Service Camp called Genesis Week. And we had a three-year rotation of the curriculum. And so I worked with them all the time, went through uh, one of their education programs called the Institute of Biblical Worldview Studies that our ministry does. And, um, and Dr. Sharp was retiring, and we had just kind of felt like we needed to go wherever the Lord led. And the... We talked and conversed, and we joined the ministry in 2018. And so that's my family right here, okay? So that's me. That's my lovely, lovely wife. And then there's Justice, Moriah, Galley, Gideon, Titus, and Nathaniel, who was just born on July 4th this past year. So 
Uh, that's my family. So this is our ministry family. And so what we do for uh, the majority of the time is we go around and we are a worldview ministry. Worldview is a big thing we talk about because everyone has one. It's the lenses through which you view the world, how you understand people. How do you view people? What do you think of people? Are they amazing, beautiful, precious creatures and image bearers of the creator God? Or are they just some kind of highly evolved animal life form? See, how do you view people? How do you view what's right and what's wrong? How do you base that? What is your view of this? What is your view of these? Everything you look at is based on your worldview. There are only two worldviews out there. Little variations within them, but there are only two. It's either a biblical one or not. Biblical-based worldview or not. A non-biblical worldview. And here's the thing. I'm always in need of making sure, fine-tuning my worldview that it is in line with God's Word. I don't always have it perfect and exact, so guess what I always need to keep doing? I need to keep studying all the time, all right? It never stops. The learning never stops. We need to keep doing this. And so we go around and we teach worldview, and we address these issues because Billy Dyer, evangelist over in Virginia, just had a a baby born just a few days ago, uh, he and his wife. He wrote in the Gospel Unashamed, you know, Summit Theological Seminary, He wrote a few years ago, what I'm contending is that there are four major questions to be asked. This is when you're talking to somebody. Does truth exist? Does any God exist? Are miracles possible? Did the resurrection really happen? He says, and this is the trick. The problem is that the church is stuck on number four, the resurrection, while the culture is asking number one. Well, that's fine, but does truth really exist? That may be true for you, but that's not true for me. See? And so, he said, how are we going to tell them that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is an absolute truth when they are questioning whether truth exists and flat out denying miracles from a philosophical basis? You see, I tried this once. There was this brand new Dodge Challenger, B5 Blue, um, <clears throat> Uh, had a 5.7 in me. Anyway, and I wanted to get it, and so I went to the bank, and I said, do I have uh, the money to buy this, this van? I said, I, I, want, I, want, to buy, I want to buy this car, uh, this, this muscle car. And they said, well, um, you only have $43.06. I said, no, 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 I have $43,000 in there. You know, she said, no, that's not what you have. And I said, well, that may be true for you, but that's not true for me. <laughs> it didn't work. How I felt about the situation didn't change the truth, did it? It's the same thing about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It may be true for you, but not true for me. Really? It either did happen in history, a real historical event, or it did not. There's no feeling about it. How I feel about it doesn't change it. And when we look at the evidence, the support for whether it did or did not happen, it is one of the most attested to witnessed events recorded in history. Wow. My feelings about the matter doesn't change the truth. But the truth sure can change my feelings about it. If I will let it. And that's what the issue is here. Again, in all of this that we do and we address, it's, you'll see, it's never a matter of this. As Paul writes in Ephesians 4, it's a matter of this. And so that's why we address this. We deal with worldview. We talk about this. Our, um, <clears throat> our mission statement is somewhat based on the challenge, our theme verse that Jesus gives to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, when he's teaching him all these things, and Nicodemus, who's one of the most well-educated men in all the land, isn't getting it, and Jesus says, if I tell you earthly things that you don't understand, how will, I, how will you believe I tell you heavenly things? You see the challenge? You see the challenge? Jesus literally is saying, you look up anything this book claims, lists, describes, Anything, people, places, locations, times, events, scientific observations. You find just one thing in there, and 
If it turns out not to be true, you just take that and you just chuck it over there and don't pay any more attention to it. Don't waste your time. But when you do go and check it out and you do study and you find that everything this book says turns out to be true, then not only can you believe the things you can go see, guess what else you can believe? Things you can't yet see. See, Jesus thinks this book is so amazing, he will literally bet your eternity on it. And so our, our theme, our mission statement is we train disciples. That's really our focus is because our focus is the church in some ways. And yes, it's very evangelistic, but you have to realize we've got to stop the bleeding in our churches we're losing so many people. And so we go around training disciples to trust the Bible's history for its accuracy so they will trust its promises for their destiny. And they won't walk away from this. So that's, that's kind of what we do. And so, as we said, we go all around the world, or all around the world, all around the country. It's kind of hard to take these guys in an airplane and uh, <laughs> go around the world. Uh, although we do uh, get to go into Canada from time to time. We've been to Canada several times with them. That's always fun going through customs. Ask Bob about that. Oh, yeah. What do you have in that trailer? <laughs> they always want to look for some reason. So uh, we go all across the country. Bob was just a couple weeks ago up in northwestern Montana with Matt, Matt Miles. And uh, now he's over here in, uh, in Pennsylvania. So he's just skipping time zones here lately. And uh, later this year, we still have uh, events over in uh, uh, North Carolina, Wyoming, uh, Vancouver, Washington, possibly uh, later this fall. And, and the whole, whole summer, actually almost the whole year, we've been going nonstop since January. And um, it's just a, a wonderful op opportunity. We can take these dinosaurs around and get to share them. And so that's what we do mostly. That's kind of our main focus is using the dinosaurs uh, that the Lord has blessed us with over all these uh, many years and, and travel around and going to places and uh, do youth events and church events. We also do VBSs. Our whole summer is packed full with VBS events and church camp events. Uh, we currently have two curriculums that we have. We're working on a third. Uh, our main curriculum that we do uh, everywhere is usually called Our Lost World, and we go from uh, creation uh, through the flood all the way to, uh, to Jesus, kind of in, in those uh, days or nights of the VBS, and uh, talk about our lost world and how it can be saved through Jesus and what happened that it, that it became lost. And then uh, we have uh, the Light Lab. That was our new one we just did. Uh, Matt, uh, his specialty is astronomy. He is very, very good astronomy. He took uh, some courses over at uh, Oklahoma University. And uh, he just loves it. We have this uh, really neat telescope. I'll show you a picture here in a minute. And then one that I'm working on is called Faith That Floats. That's a, a flood-based one, uh, themed um, VBS. So we're hoping to get that one up and going here coming up. So we got two currently and working on a third on VBSs. And then we have a couple others that we're working on as well. So when Matt goes around and does the Light Lab one, we have this uh, um, Orion Dobsonian telescope, 50. 15 inch mirror, is that right, Bob? I think 15 inch mirror. Yeah, it's like this big around, and it's about this tall when you set it all the way up, and it, it's really neat. Um, there were some church, I, I know there was at least uh, one or two that their VBSs, they raised the funds for us to help get this, uh, this telescope. It was really neat uh, a few years ago. So um, it, it's a lot of fun, especially when you have Matt who knows how to work it. You know, <laughs> so. Uh, we, we look at all kinds of stuff when we go through play, go to places, we, and you're like, well, it's daylight. Well, sometimes the moon's up during the day. You can look at that. He also has a solar filter we can put on it and see uh, sunspots. But then at night, oh, man, it's really neat. Some of the really neat stellar phenomena we get to use. And there's also this fancy little camera thing that it came with that you can use it to project live what you're seeing. So if you've got a, a larger audience, you can use that. So that's part of, uh, part of that ministry, what we do there as well. Did I say I like history? There's a few places I'm hoping to see while I'm here in the Pittsburgh area, uh, especially Revolutionary War related. Uh, I had taught, uh, my, what I taught when I was teaching history was U.S. Constitution and, uh, and uh, economics. And so U.S. Constitution is based purely out of the Revolutionary Era uh, during that time frame of our country's founding. And so... Uh, 
been asked to share on that, and so we developed a program called Our American Founding uh, because there's something special about the American founding and uh, because there's a little foundation uh, upon which that all stands. And if you don't know that history, it's just really neat. And so we really worked on developing that and, and have displays and costumes, you know. <laughs> and, so, and, uh, uh, and so I really enjoyed doing that and teaching that. So that's become a new facet of the ministry that uh, we have because guess what's happened to our history? It's not just being rewritten. There is a level of it being evolutionized. And you're like, what does that mean? You'd be amazed at how much your worldview, just because of what we're constantly inundated with in the culture, in the media, how much our, our worldview has been evolutionized. And you're like, well, I may not believe evolution. Well, that, that's, that's, not, that's not the whole story there. See, being evolutionized I mean, is this whole philosophy, this whole, it's a doctrine, it's, it's a man-made religion. And how you view things, that worldview, a secular, naturalistic worldview, is based out of that whole evolutionizing process. Okay, Darwinian type evolution. Now, Darwin didn't come up with all of this stuff, all right? But that's been the proponent, and that's what it's called today. Guess what's happened to our history? Same thing. The worldview has been penetrated to make it look like our founding was one that wasn't moral. It was an immoral founding. You, you see this all the time in media, okay? Oh, it was based, uh, the foundation of this country was one built on all kinds of immoral, immoralities and sin and everything. By the way, you know why that is such a big deal? Because what was the foundation for it? So when you call the foundation of America immoral and, and based on these you know, reprehensible sins, guess what you're saying about this? Guess what you're saying about the church? Guess what happens to the church in the eyes of the culture? That's the real attack. It's another one of Satan's pawns, his, his arrows he's shooting at the church. Okay, and so that's why this has become a big uh, kind of important aspect of the ministry and why we, why we do this program as well when we go places. So... Anyway, so that, that's kind of, there, there's probably other things we do as a ministry and, uh, and what we do, but um, that's just kind of a, a quick general overview for you. So, um, is there only 20 seconds left? Because I'm ready to do questions. You don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't wear, I don't wear a watch. So I'm oblivious. 15 minutes. Fantastic. 10, 15 minutes. All right. So, here's your opportunity to ask the questions uh, about the ministry or... about dinosaurs. You can do that, too. So, all right. Yes, sir. Um, as far as, like, them going extinct, obviously, I don't believe that a bunch of meteors of the Earth, you know, killed them all. Yes. Now, was it after the flood that they would be flowing and dying out to end up changing to make it look like the atmosphere because that layer of water's not around the Earth? You going to be here Tuesday night? <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. All right, Tuesday night. There you go. That's my answer. Uh, no, no, no. Okay. Very good question. All right. Here's the main thing about fossils, okay? Fossils are pretty much rock, okay? It's gone through this process of the original material being replaced with these minerals that make that uh, the fancy word is permineralized. It petrified it, okay? Like petrified wood, and has changed its composition. So it's pretty much rock. It's really heavy then, okay? So to do that, you have to have lots of mud, Lots of water very quickly. That's how we teach it in VBS, okay? Because if it's not buried very quickly, what happens to something out on the road? It goes away over time, and there's lots of reasons why it goes away. It never becomes a fossil, does it? We don't have fossilization of, of life forms all over the place in today's world. We don't see that. It does happen under certain circumstances, but we don't see this massive fossilization all over the planet. So we find fossils. If I showed you a picture from the paleobiology database, which I will do one of these nights, um, you'll see the fossils being recorded all over the world. Now, what do you need to make a fossil? Lots of mud brought by lots of water very quickly to make a fossil. And we have fossils where? Everywhere, all over the world. So at some point... At some time, all over the world, there had to be lots of mud and lots of very quickly. 
Okay? Kind of answers the question, doesn't it? So that's how all the fossils, the vast majority of fossils were formed was through that event. What means what was alive at the time of the flood? Everything in the fossil record. Okay? Most everything in the fossil record. Which means then, when it came time to load animals up on the ark, what would have been alive that would have been part of the two of every kind? Okay? The dinosaurs. They would have been on there, okay? So then they come off the ark after that year-long event. You know it was more than just 40 days and nights, right? That was a year they were on the ark with these creatures. Wow. You thought our year was long last year. <laughs> Whew, man. Okay, so you have, a, you have this year. They come off the ark. I'm going to show you some stuff Tuesday night about some models, some ideas of what took place during the flood. And when you see how that turned our world upside down, you talk about massive changes to our atmospheric conditions, to climate patterns. I maintain we're still to this day, how crazy our climate can be from time to time, our weather patterns, we're still trying to recover from this. There's going to be major, major obstacles for larger, higher metabolism type reptiles to survive in the conditions after that. It's going to be much more difficult to survive than it was pre-flood. And so eventually over time, uh, they did pretty good for a while. you got to give them credit for how long they did last, because that's going to be Wednesday night, how, le- how long we have records of them. That's Wednesday night. You don't miss Wednesday night. That's, that's, it's history, so it's my favorite night. You know, but uh, um, we're going to see how long they kind of finally and eventually died out, and the connections there to what led to their extinction uh, based on our understanding, our ideas, okay? They're all, they're all ideas, but we want them to make sure they're biblically based, you know, and that the supporting evidence coincides with the idea, and, and yeah, we got some pretty good ideas of what happened to them. So, yeah, no, not a meteorite. I'm going to talk about the meteorite thing on Tuesday night. It's, it's entertaining, because I was told it one time at, uh, at a natural history museum in Oklahoma, and yeah, it's, it's quite a story, the whole meteorite thing. You, you want to hear that one, so very good. Next question. Very, oh, man, that is one of the great questions about it. Because here's the deal. Here's the deal when, they, when these guys are digging up these fossils. The vast majority of the time, you have to understand, the vast majority, only 0.0025% of the time do you ever find more than one bone. The vast majority of the fossil record the vast majority of the fossil record, okay? Uh, young man, would you, would you come up here, please? Yeah, yeah, come right up here. Yeah, right. Okay. Huh? Nathan. Nathan, very good, okay. All right, if he represented all the fossils that we have an understanding of in the world today, and we stacked them all up in a column, this much right here, 95% is a bunch of clams, shells, mollusks, marine stuff. Then the next 4.75% is stuff like plants, um, in, insects, invertebrates, and, the, and fish. Mostly water stuff. And where do we find this stuff? All over the world. Okay. Then 0.25%, so like this right here, <laughs> that would be vertebrates, animals with backbones. And out of that, 0.0025% of the time do we find more than one bone. So here's what happens then. Everybody wants to have a dinosaur they get to name and get their name published in journals. And woo, I got to name a dinosaur species. So guess what happens when they find one bone? They name a dinosaur species. So here's what's been going on the last about 10 years in paleontology is they're trying to take all of these 
all these vast arrays of everything that's been named and get them into databases and with computer technology, scan and analyze all the fossils and start doing some, compare, some comparing and contrasting here to narrow down just how many species do we really have, okay? Just how many do we really have an understanding of? Because here, here's, here's the deal, like this one right here, the Pachycephalosaurus, I'm going to talk about her tonight, okay? But, okay, she's got this domed head, all right? See that? Okay. She's got this domed head. Guess what? We found some that don't have domes. We have some that have really small domes. Guess what they do for every one of those? Name a whole species. How do you know that? How do you know one is male, one's female? How do you know one is a juvenile? Because the ones without domes are smaller. Maybe they just haven't grown it. You see how that, okay. So here's what we do. Thank you very much. Thank you. So here's what we do when it comes to talking about how many animals were on the ark. On the ark. They were supposed to take two of every what? Kind. Two of every kind. You see Mr. Sabercat over here? Smilodon californicus, known more familiar to us as saber-toothed cat. Okay, 700-pound kitty. Nine-inch, well, no, wait, seven-inch. Seven-inch teeth here. He could open his mouth almost 90 degrees so he could get the bite on stuff. You kitty, kitty, kitty. You know, I mean, this 700-pound cat. How many cats do you need on the ark to get all the varieties that have been extinct and we have alive today? Two. If it has the full genetic code in it or enough genetic code in it to get everything we have today, you only need two. Might there have been more than two? Maybe. Maybe he, had, maybe he had two of large cats, two of small cats. That's it. Is there room on the ark for all the cats you need to get all the varieties we have today? Yes. yes. Okay. Two of every kind. When it comes to the dinosaurs, some great research done by Dr. Tim Clary um, of the Institute of Creation Research, very good expert on dinosaurs, written several books on dinosaurs, and some of his other colleagues there. They have, based on their understanding, of and talking with secular paleontologists as well, come out in 60 kinds. 60 kinds, okay? So like right here, we have Tyrannosaurus rex, and we have Albertosaurus. They're both in the Tyrannosaur family. So do you need both of those guys on the ark? No, you just need two Tyrannosaurs. And you can get all the varieties of tyrannosaurs and out of that family on, on the ark, okay? And so, when they come out, they got 60 kinds. So how many dinosaurs do we need on the ark? Two of each kind, so about 120. All right? Average size of dinosaurs? Bison. American bison. Buffalo. That's the average size of adults. But are you going to be taking old adults on the ark? No, because what do they got to do when they get off the ark? They got to have babies, and hopefully several times have babies to repopulate species. So you're going to be taking juveniles, average size of dinosaur juveniles, size of a sheep. So all we're talking on the ark is 120 sheep-sized animals. They could have their own little corner over there. You can call it Jurassic Ark, whatever you want to do, okay? <laughs> all right, so there you go. So, so the understanding of how the variety of dinosaurs is changing all the time. And it changes from paleontologist to paleontologist as to how many different species of dinosaur there are. So, very good question. Very winded answer. But, uh, very, thank you, thank you. All righty. Is my time up? Am I, are we good? We good? Well, okay, one more. Yes? I had heard that the Loch Ness Monster maybe some kind of marine reptile. Yeah. yeah. The, lots of interesting records and descriptions about that creature for many, many years. You know. Um, now, it's not going to live forever, obviously. So if it's still around today, you know. It's interesting how many of these things have gone away with the invention of cell phone cameras. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, but yet, yeah, I would have no problem with that being some type of marine reptile that would have existed during that time, you know. Can I confirm that? No, absolutely, you know, I can't, you know, stand here 100% certain, you know, what that was. But uh, it would not be a problem for us with a biblical worldview of that creature 
maybe of surviving up to that time. You know, if it was some kind of what we would think of as extinct marine reptile. So, yeah. Very good. Well, thank you very much. I, I hope you're going to be here every night because there's going to be something different each night, okay? And uh, we're going to talk about all kinds of, of fun stuff, but uh, we're going to have a lot of dinosaur fun tonight, okay? So, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know what we do to get dismissed. Just, just tell the guy to sit down. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll come over to the mic. But uh, that gets me excited uh, with what we're going to be talking about and doing and uh, uh, Hopefully, uh, we'll pack the place. People will come out, bring their kids, see some of these things, learn about these things they're battling with in the elementary schools and high schools and even in the colleges. And uh, we're looking forward to everything that uh, Ryan has to share with us. And again, there's a lot of good reading and books out there if you'd like to be able to purchase some of that stuff and take it home and uh, read and study more. So let's go ahead and close with prayer. We'll get ready for our morning worship time. Dear God and Heavenly Father, we love you and praise you. We again thank you that uh, we could be here for um, our Sunday school time this morning. We thank you for Ryan and uh, the presentation that he made about the mission of the Christian Truth Foundation. And then also answering some questions and talking about some of the work and that that they do uh, with this great ministry. Uh, be with us now, dear God, as we go into our worship time. And again, may you receive the honor and the glory and praise from all that we do. We love you, and we thank you for Christ, our great King and Lord and Redeemer. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's wonderful name. Amen. All right, everybody. Thank you.